In this unit, we're going to continue learning about propagation from seed. More specifically, we're going to look at the factors influencing germination and steps we can take to optimize our success with seed. By the end of this unit, you'll be able to describe the seed germination process. You'll be able to describe methods of measuring seed quality and you'll be able to describe the factors affecting seed germination. So let's get started. Having a basic understanding of the pollination and fertilization processes, seed structure, and the factors that influence seed germination and emergence can all help us be successful when growing plants from seed. Equally importantly, this knowledge helps us troubleshoot when things don't go as planned. The main factors influencing seed germination and emergence are seed quality, seedbed preparation, substrate physical properties, sowing depth, and the environmental factors, light, temperature, water, and gases, mainly oxygen and carbon dioxide. Internationally accepted regulations covering seed quality have been established for most commercial food crop seeds. These rules are administered by the International Seed Testing Association and cover quality aspects of seed, such as germination percentage, germination rate, uniformity, and purity. In the US, we also have the Federal Seed Act, which includes legislation governing the testing and labeling of commercial seed. Individual states also have state legislation covering seed quality. Almost all commercially produced seed is tested for these measures of quality, and all the large seed breeders have their own seed testing labs. Large international seed breeders who have a local presence around here include Sakata Seed in Morgan Hill and Salinas, Syngenta in Gilroy, and Benary in Watsonville. In the previous slide, I mentioned that seed quality is assessed in several ways. We look at purity, viability, the germination rate, and germination uniformity. So let's take a look at each one of these in turn. Seed purity is usually expressed as a percentage and refers to the percent of a batch of seed that is the stated species. While you might expect always to see 100%, it's not uncommon to see lower percentages. That non-seed matter is chaff, maybe a small amount of weed seed or other crop seed, and perhaps some debris like tiny pieces of grit or soil that have made their way into the seed batch during the harvesting process. For example, on this label on the right, you can see that this batch of seed has a purity percent of 93.8. And the rest of that is made up of the inert matter here, so 5.6% inert matter, and then 0.6% of weed seed. Most commercial seed is fairly clean and pure, but sometimes you'll be collecting seed yourself. Perhaps you work for a native plant nursery that grows plants for vegetation projects and you have to do site-specific collections of seeds in the wild. Perhaps you work for a nursery that grows specialty or niche market crops for which commercial seed isn't available and you're collecting seed from your own stock plants or, with permission, from plants in the wild. Or perhaps you're collecting seed from your own garden. One of the most important things to do is to make sure that you're collecting seed and not just chaff. This sounds really silly, but it's easily done when you collect the seed yourself. It's not always really easy to tell the difference between seed and the remains of the dried calices. Sometimes there can be a lot of chaff relative to the amount of seed, and you have to sort through the chaff carefully to find the seed, especially if it's quite small. 
It really helps, if possible, to find out what the colour and the shape of the seed are ahead of time so that you know what you're looking for amongst all of that chaff. In my experience, our native buckwheats, which are in the genus Eriogonum, are a good example of flower heads that produce a lot of chaff relative to the amount of seed. And the photo on the right is of rosy buckwheat, Eriogonum grande variety rubescens, which we have growing in the beneficial insect planter bed at Cabrillo next to the organic farm. Secondly, remember that I mentioned in the previous unit that some plants are dioecious. As a reminder, dioecious plants are ones that produce separate male and female flowers on separate plants. Sometimes the male and female flower heads can look very similar, as in the restios, the family of South African rushes. So make sure you're collecting from a female plant, otherwise you'll just be sowing chaff. It can be a really good idea to sex plants like this when the flowers are open and then label them as male or female so that you remember which is which. The germination rate is a measure of how fast seeds germinate. It's usually expressed in days and usually in conjunction with the germination percentage. For example, we might say that the germination percentage and rate are 97% over seven days. Sometimes you'll see the germination percentage referred to as the germination rate, especially on the growers instruction sheets that most of the large seed com companies compile for their customers. The image on the right is an example of this misapplication of the term germination rate. You can see here that the germination percentage of Aquilegia origami is 85%. So technically, this is the germination percentage, not the germination rate. Germination uniformity refers to the ability of a batch of seed to germinate at roughly the same time when given appropriate environmental conditions. If you're a grower, Uniformity is important because you want your whole crop to germinate roughly at the same time because crop scheduling and efficient production rely on this. For example, you may be wanting to grow a particular crop in time for a specific holiday, or you may have agreements with local restaurants that you'll have a specific herb available at an agreed time. If your seed doesn't germinate uniformly, it can throw off your whole production schedule. You may be left with unsold plants after the holiday because your production was delayed. Or you may earn yourself a name for being unreliable if you regularly can't deliver your products on time, and you may even lose contracts. So it's important to start with good quality seed. It's equally important to plan your crop scheduling really carefully and we'll discuss crop scheduling in a later module. Let's look now at the two ways in which seed viability is measured. Seed viability refers to whether or not the seed is alive, and it's measured in two ways. Firstly, you can do a germination percentage test, or in labs, they'll often do a tetrazoleum test. The germination percentage test, which you're doing in this week's lab exercise, is a measure of actual germination, in contrast to the tetrazoleum test, which is a measure of potential germination. In the germination percentage test, the seed is allowed to germinate and you actually see the root and shoot emerge through the seed coat. The results of both germination percentage tests and tetrazoleum tests are expressed as a percentage over a given period of time. So for example, 95% over 12 days at 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. In this slide, you can see a photo taken at Sakata's seed lab in Salinas where they're assessing the germination percentage of mustard in almost exactly the same way as we're doing in the lab exercise this week. 
The Sakata Seed Lab prefers to use brown paper as opposed to white for their germination percentage tests because the pale coloured young roots and shoots tend to show up better against that darker background. Another test of seed viability, which is done in commercial labs, is the TTZ chloride test, or the tetrazoleum test. This is a measure of potential germination. And actual germination in the field or nursery will, of course, depend on the environmental conditions provided by the grower and or Mother Nature. So the photos on the right show a tetrazoleum test that's been done on corn or maize. In the upper photo, you can see seeds of corn that are cut in half longitudinally to expose the embryo prior to it being immersed in a 0.1% tetrazoleum solution. The lower photo shows the results of the tetrazoleum test, and the pinkish red stain indicates the presence of carbon dioxide which is produced as a result of respiratory activity of a viable embryo. If the embryo isn't viable, the stain doesn't turn pink and that indicates that that particular seed is dead. If the seed's respiring, it's an indication that it's alive and therefore has the potential to germinate. This photo just shows you the seed germination room in the seed lab at Sakata Seed in Salinas. The room is maintained at a constant temperature and these containers contain mustard and broccoli seed that are being assessed for uniformity. And you can see that they're providing light in this germination room using fluorescent lights. They don't have LED lights in here yet. Seed maturity is also an important factor in germination success. If you're collecting your own seed, make sure the seed is ripe or mature before you harvest it. During the ripening period, the plant is laying down the carbohydrate reserves in the seed that we mentioned when we were talking about seed structure in the previous unit. If the seed is harvested while it's still immature, there may not be sufficient reserves for the seed to both germinate and emerge above ground. Usually there's a change in colour of the seed as it matures and starts to lose much of its water and dries out. The photo on the right here shows unripe seeds of the California native shrub bladderpod or Peritoma arborea, which is one of the seeds you've got in your package of materials. Compare the colour of these unripe seeds in the photo with the much darker brown colour of the ripe seed that you all have. When you're harvesting seed yourself, it can sometimes be a race between you and the wildlife as to who gets the seed first. You may be able to get around this by collecting seeds from some species before they're fully ripe and then leaving them to continue ripening in a dry place. In this case, it's usually helpful to cut some of the stem with the flower heads. If the seed you're collecting is formed in capsules that split open explosively, you should cover them with a couple of sheets of newspaper, a piece of cheesecloth, or some other lightweight breathable, breathable material that won't hold in the moisture. If you don't do this, you'll be scrambling all over the floor trying to find your seeds. Lupine and California poppy seeds are really good examples of seed capsules that split open explosively. An alternative method for beating the wildlife is to enclose the flower heads in a mesh bag while they're still on the plant. This is a really labour intensive process, but it's a useful technique if the seed is particularly valuable and you don't want to risk losing it. You should discard any seed that's shriveled or small and check for holes made by seed-eating insects such as weevils. These insects eat the carbohydrate reserves in the seed and can eat so much that the seed either won't germinate or perhaps runs out of energy before it emerges above ground. 
Sometimes the insects just eat a small amount and you can see the telltale notches in the cotyledons when they emerge. In general, seed isn't affected by pathogens as much as vegetative methods of propagation, such as cuttings. There is still a risk though, and we should be careful. Pathogens can be bacterial, fungal or viral, and can be inside the seed or on the seed surface. Pathogens inside the seed will have come from the mother plant before the junction between the seed and its mother plant is sealed. This means it's important to make sure the mother plant that the seed is collected from are kept healthy and free of diseases. Pathogens can also be on the seed surface. So if possible, try to avoid collecting seed from the ground and acorns and buckeye seeds are good examples of seed which we often end up collecting from the ground. If you can, try to collect seed from stems that are at least two feet above the soil surface. Both surface-borne pathogens and pathogens inside the seed can be treated with hot water baths, but not all seed can be treated in this way and you have to pay close attention to the temperature and the length of the soak. Different plant species have different tolerances for heat, so make sure you check what your seed's tolerance is before you go down this path. You should also check to see what temperature is needed and for how long to kill whatever pathogen it is that you're trying to target. It's really easy to kill the seed itself as well as the pathogens. And the pathogens may not be killed completely if they're right in the middle of the seed because it's difficult to get that area of the seed hot enough to kill the pathogen without actually killing the seed as well. Soaking the seed in a Clorox solution can kill most surface-borne pathogens and this method tends to be safer to use than a hot water bath for surface-borne pathogens but it's important to remember that Clorox can also act as a germination stimulant. So this disinfectant may not be suitable if you're planning on storing the seed because the germination process might already have started. Seeds need to absorb water from the substrate that they're sown in, in order to activate the enzymes that start the germination process. So close seed to substrate contact is necessary in order for the seed to absorb water quickly. If we're growing in the ground, either in a field, raised beds or in the soil in our garden, we should cultivate the soil in order to produce a fine tilth and a fairly level surface. If we're sowing seed in plug trays or other types of containers, we need to select a potting mix with a relatively fine but freely draining texture. And we'll talk in more detail about potting mixes in another module. We should make sure that containers or plug trays are filled evenly, and it's always useful to water the substrate thoroughly before sowing, as well as afterwards, in order to eliminate large air pockets, to ensure that the medium is uniformly moist, and to allow the substrate to settle. If you're going to be covering the seed after it's sown, be sure to leave some space for that. As a general rule of thumb, the recommended sowing depth is two to three times the diameter of the seed. If we sow it too shallowly, the substrate surface and seed may dry out and interrupt the germination process, or even halt it completely depending on the stage of germination. If we sow the seed too deeply, it may run out of energy reserves before the shoot emerges above ground and can start to produce its own reserves through photosynthesis. If we're working with really tiny seed, we can just broadcast it over the surface of the substrate and likely water it in. We don't usually need to cover it. Examples of seed that we can do this with are 
plants from our California native genus of succulent, succulents, Dudleya, and the Rush Junkers patens. If you're growing at home or in a relatively large nursery where they're growing specialty crops and sowing by hand, then a useful technique for broadcasting very small seed evenly is to use a pepper shaker. Finally, the seed should be covered to the appropriate depth with potting mix, vermiculite or perlite. Fine vermiculite is used more often than perlite to cover seed because it holds moisture, so helps to keep the substrate surface moist, and it's really easy to spread it evenly and thinly. In order to germinate, seeds need to absorb water and the water activates the enzymes necessary for the germination process. During germination, water uptake by the seed occurs in three phases, as shown in this diagram on the right. The first phase of water uptake is the imbibition phase. And during this phase, it doesn't matter if the substrate dries out. The second phase is the activation or lag phase, during which the enzymes are activated and the physiological processes of germination are started. It's important from this point on that the substrate stays moist. If it dries out, the germination process may be interrupted and at best, the seed may go into a state of secondary dormancy. At worst, the seed may die. In the third phase, the radical ruptures the seed coat and emerges, and this is followed by growth of the shoot. So as you can see, it's important that the substrate stay evenly moist during the germination process. And it's also important that the substrate not be waterlogged, and I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. In this diagram here, you've got an illustration of the germination, emergence and establishment phase, just emphasizing some of the information that was talked about in the previous slide. So let's talk about environmental factors affecting germination now, and we're going to start with temperature. Germination is a chemical process, and like most chemical reactions, occurs faster as the substrate temperature and the ambient temperature increase. Temperature affects both germination percentage and the germination rate, so the speed of germination. And commercial seed producers usually specify three temperature points for germination of their seed. We have the minimum temperature, which is the lowest at which seed will germinate. There's the maximum temperature, which is the highest temperature at which the seed will germinate. And then the optimum temperature, which is the one at which the highest number of seeds will germinate in the shortest length of time. These temperature ranges vary between species. So if you're working with commercial seed, you should always check the growers information sheets provided by the seed companies so that you know what the best temperatures for germination are going to be. Let's talk a little bit about gases now. Exchange of gases between the substrate and the seed embryo is essential for rapid and uniform germination. Oxygen is needed for respiration in germinating seeds and after emergence in the roots as well. If oxygen is limited, germination will be delayed or prevented. Oxygen limiting conditions may occur in waterlogged conditions after heavy rains or if too much irrigation water is being applied and all the soil pore spaces are filled with water instead of the smaller pores having water and the larger ones being filled with air. 
Carbon dioxide is a product of respiration and can accumulate in the substrate under conditions of poor aeration, but this is rarely a problem. Finally, let's talk about light and its effect on germination. Most commercial seed has been bred so that the light requirement isn't important. But light quality, so the wavelength, and light duration, the photoperiod, can affect seed germination. In nature, the seed response to light is a survival mechanism. Light quality and quantity are indicative of seasonal changes, and seed is genetically programmed to germinate when the environmental conditions are the most appropriate for seedling survival. The light requirement is often combined with specific soil moisture conditions and diurnal temperature fluctuations. And we'll talk more about this in next week's module on breaking dormancy in seeds. In some nurseries, LED lights are now being used to manipulate the light quality in order to stimulate seed germination and promote seedling establishment afterwards. LED lights are expensive to install though, and the seed response to light isn't universal across all species and varieties. So it's important to prepare a thorough cost-benefit analysis before investing in LEDs. But as more research is done and the cost of LEDs relative to fluorescent lighting comes down, it's likely that more nurseries will be installing LEDs. So it's important for all of us to stay abreast of research that's being done on LED lights and it, their effect on germination. Commercial seed companies offer growers seed enhancement services that can improve germination success in the nursery or in the field. And these services include pelleting, priming, film coating, and disinfection. With pelleting, the seeds are coated in diatomaceous earth and a binder. And this makes the seeds bigger it gives them all a uniform shape and it makes seeds much easier for seeding machines to handle. And beneficial mycorrhizae can also be included in the pelleting process for, of course, an additional cost. The priming process is a little bit different to pelleting. And here the germination process is actually started at the seed company and then they have proprietary technology which enables them to suspend the germination process at a specific stage and then the seeds are pelleted. So priming can take um, up to five days off the germination and emergence stage and that doesn't sound like a very long time but if you're growing a short-term crop, it may enable you to get an additional crop in the field every year. So those five days um, add up. Another, surface that, another service that's added by commercial seed companies is film coating. And in this process, fungicides and or insecticides in a polymer base are added to the seed as a coating and um, this helps to prevent diseases forming as the seed germinates and emerges. And then lastly, disinfection. I've already talked a little bit about um, treatments that we can use to get rid of pathogens on seed. Well, the commercial seed companies are able to do this for you if you're working with um, some of the large companies. So they will do the hot water or chemical baths for you in order to kill the pathogens. And just as I said before, the, the timing and the temperature are any, of any of these treatments are critical 
and of species and sometimes variety specific. Lastly, and you'll probably hear me talk about these two points several times over the semester, but I think they're always worth repeating. Keep detailed records so that you can repeat and improve on successes and troubleshoot problems when things don't go quite as planned. You may think you'll remember exactly what you did to your seeds or your cuttings or whatever other plants you're propagating, but chances are that you won't, especially if you're growing more than one plant. So make a note of the date the seed was sown, any pretreatments that you gave the seed, what the source of the seed was, the condition of the seed, the condition of the mother plants. What substrate did you grow the seeds in? Where was it germinated? Were they outside? Were they in a hoop house? Were they in a, a greenhouse? How long did it take for the shoots to emerge? What was your emergence percentage? And how long did it take for the seedlings to be ready for transplanting? All of these points, and you can probably think of more, will help you to um, improve on your crop success each time you're growing each crop. And lastly, always build efficiency and safety into your workflow, especially in a commercial enterprise where labor is expensive. But this isn't just about saving money. Um, it's also about safety. When you're setting up a seed sowing line, and it doesn't matter if you're sowing by hand or you have the newest, most state-of-the-art robotic machinery, consider how the work can be done in the most efficient and logical way to produce the desired quality of young plants in the least amount of time. And don't do something in a particular way just because it's always been done that way. There are always ways in which we can improve our work. So lastly, let's summarize what we've covered in this lecture. Successful propagation from seed involves starting with good quality, viable seed that's free from pests and diseases. If we're collecting seed ourselves, we should make sure we're collecting seed and not just chaff. Most large seed companies provide detailed growing guides for their seed, and these are worth following. Seed should be sown at a depth of approximately two to three times its diameter. And we should sow seed in a substrate that provides good seed to substrate contact in order for the seed to absorb water quickly to activate the germination process. We should keep the substrate moist at all times, but not waterlogged. And we should aim to provide optimum temperatures and light levels during germination and establishment. Once the seedlings have emerged, consider reducing the irrigation in order to reduce the risk of disease. And finally, Keep detailed propagation notes for every crop so that you can repeat successes and troubleshoot problems and continuously assess the workflow in order to work efficiently and safely.